Amen. We've been doing a series uh, called Disempowering, Disempowering Doubt, Disempowering Fear, Disempowering Disappointment. We want to disempower the negative things that the kingdom of darkness tries to bring against us. Uh, last week in the uh, first service, I, I, I spoke on disempowering fear. Uh, but in, in this service last week, God changed the whole message. And I spoke on hope. And that's the, the, the way God was leading us. But uh, it's amazing how, how God will lead you into doing things. Because in the early morning uh, service, God had me to do the message that I had here on hope. It was a little bit different. And then he wants me to make sure that I do this message on fear. So let's turn in our Bibles to, uh, to Mark, the fourth chapter, verse 35, please. Amen. We shout for God's word. Mark, the fourth chapter, verse 35, 41. We have a, we have a uh, story, information here about Jesus giving the disciples a directive about going over to the other side. And he said this, he said, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. In other words, God's always advancing us. The Bible even says we go from faith to faith. That's a maturity in hearing the word of God. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we go from faith to faith. We mature in the things of God through the word of God. We go from faith to faith and to glory to glory. What does that mean? Well, every time that I go to another level of faith, it means that in, in, in exercising my faith, standing in faith, believing in faith, praying in faith, God is going to get the glory by the answer that he brings to us by us standing in faith. So Jesus said, let's cross over to the other side. And it says, now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves beat into the boat so that it was all, already filling. Don't you know that every time that you start on a path to do something for God, the enemy is going to show up. He's going to do anything he can to stop you. Because he knows that once you pursue and you follow after God's purpose and destiny in your life, there are going to be people there that you are going to influence. That's the reason that God wants us to be delivered from being selfish and thinking that life is all about me. Life is not all about me. Life is about the people that I have been and will be assigned to influence. And not a one of us in this place is not an influencer. We're going to influence people one way or the other. You know as parents we influence our children. And we see that influence upon them, the way they act, the things that they do. We see our influence manifest in their lives. And so every time that you start doing things for the kingdom of God, you start saying, this is the way I'm going to live. This is what God says in his word. I'm going to start living like this. I'm going to start doing like this. I'm going to start giving. I, I'm going to start helping people. I'm going to get involved with volunteering. I, I'm going to do something for the kingdom of God. And the moment you start doing that... Right after you get into a position, you get excited, all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. Seems like everything just goes completely contrary to what you were believing, where you were, and what you were doing. And, and, and so many people say this, God, why did you allow this to take place and happen? Well, let me say this one more time. I've said it before. God will allow you to leave this building and go rob a grocery store if you want to. He doesn't want you to do that. That is not his will for you to do that. But if you make a decision that you're going to do it, he will allow you to do it. Why? Because he didn't create you as a robot. He created you with free will. And out of that free will, he wants you to obey him. He wants you to serve Him. He wants you to love Him. And in loving Him, you will obey Him. You'll do what He's, he's called you to do. No matter what it looks like, no matter what people think, that you're going to obey and you're going to do what God's called you, uh, called you to do. So, so the Bible says that when they started out on this mission that God had given them, a great windstorm came. 
Now, they were doing nothing wrong. They were doing everything right. They were in obedience to God. Isn't it amazing that all the windstorms and the circumstances come when you're in obedience to God? Because why does, the devil, why does the devil have to put any effort on you if you're disobedient to God? If you're not living in his will. He, he, he's not going to put any effort on you. Okay? He's going to only put effort and come against that which he thinks is valuable to the kingdom of God. And that would be you. And that would be your purpose. And that would be your destiny of where God is taking you and what he wants to do. So he said, a great windstorm arose, the waves beating into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on the pillow. And they awoke him and said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Isn't that a lot of times what happens to us when trouble comes our way? God, don't you care? God, don't you love me? God, where are you? God, what's happening here? God knows exactly what's happening. He's right there with you. Matter of fact, he's inside of you. Every problem and every windstorm and every situation that comes, not only just comes to you, but it comes to God who lives right here on the inside of you. He knows what's happening. He knows what's going on. And he also knows that he's given you authority in certain situations. And he wants you to take that. But here's what happens to most of us. So many times when situations come our way that seem to be out of our control, fear sets in. And when fear sets in, it questions God's love. Fear comes, the symptoms of fear, and it begins to take over. And fear does all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, nutty stuff. It makes us think irrational. It makes us look at God in a whole different light because of something that's, that, that's happening. And, and now we're fearing that he's not going to take care of us. He's not going to provide for us. He's not going to protect us. When he's given us his word, he's given us everything that's in this Bible. And the Bible says that all the promises of God are yes, not a one of them are no. So they woke him up and said, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. That's what I was saying a while ago. He didn't have time to call a prayer meeting. This was a dangerous situation. And so therefore... He immediately had to do something about it, okay? If if you're walking down the street or you're coming out in the parking lot and somebody walks up to you with a gun, you you can't look at that person and say, excuse me, I need to text my intercessors right now. I'll be with you in just a moment. Just hold that pose, hold right there. Just just hold on, I'm, I'm getting the prayer chain going right now. You don't have time to do that. You immediately have got to invoke and use the name of Jesus. Amen? And you've got to immediately say in the name of Jesus Christ, no weapon formed against me can prosper, no evil can befall me, and I declare the wicked one touches me not. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind you, Satan. You will not touch me in Jesus' name. God said he will satisfy me with long life. Young man, you need to get saved. You've got to use the word of God. You've got to immediately speak. Can you say, and Jesus arose, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. Notice that he rebuked the wind and said to the sea. What he did is he rebuked what was behind causing the sea to act abnormal. He went to the root of what the cause was. It was the wind. And we know what was stirring the wind up. Have we forgotten that the Bible says that the devil is the prince of the power of the air? And the Bible says we wrestle not against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. Principalities, spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. And don't you realize that in the atmosphere at times the enemy himself can stir up violent weather? So that's what Jesus did. Jesus stood up and rebuked the wind. 
I remember there's been many times that tornado warnings and stuff have come and we would just pray in the spirit and we would use the word of God and rebuke that thing from coming to our house. Because why? Because immediately out of my mouth comes this, no plague or calamity can come to our dwelling in Jesus' name. No plague or calamity can come to our dwelling. No evil can befall us in the name of Jesus. And then, then there's been several times we just started praying in the spirit and started declaring the word of God. In Jesus' name. And that's what you have to do when the enemy comes and he wants to destroy in your life. And he, here's what Jesus said. Watch this. Why are you so fearful? The wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, what's the first thing he, he addresses? Fear. Fear. Fear paralyzed them. Fear made them think that they were going to lose their lives. It was over with. Every one of us has the symptom of fear. Listen to me very carefully. Every single one of us has the symptoms of fear. If the person sitting behind you right now just screamed bloody murder, you would jump out of your seat, out of your shoes, and probably collapse because you were not expecting it, and it was something that gripped you, and fear took place right then because every one of us, have to deal with fear. And the thing is, we have to understand that fear, like faith, is spiritual. Because the Bible says in 2 Timothy, the uh, the uh, first chapter, verse 7, he says, God has not given you the spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit that comes to attack you. That fear will put thoughts in your mind. Negative thoughts. Thoughts that are totally contrary to the Word of God. See, a lot of people forget that in in, uh, Isaiah 61, it says that God has given you a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. He's given you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Notice this, that when you get oppressed, depressed, and heaviness starts to come upon you, It's spiritual. It's the enemy trying to get you into a depressed state. Mentally depressed. Because if he can mentally depress you, he knows that he can have his way with you. And he knows that you'll start start thinking and acting irrationally. And he knows that you'll start thinking with just your emotions instead of with your heart and understanding what the Word of God says. And that's what he's after. So Jesus immediately addressed the problem with them. He said he addressed the problem with the storm. And then he says, why are you so fearful? And then he said this, how is it you have no faith? And so, in other words, Jesus was expecting them to take care of the problem so he could sleep. Because he'd already said, let's go to the other side. And they're sitting there going, who is this person? But guess what? When we look down through the pages of the Bible, we found out that people like the the apostle Peter remembered the example of Jesus sleeping in the middle of the storm. Remember in Acts 12 chapter when they put him in prison? And they handcuffed, I mean, they put chains on him, cuffed him up, bound him up. And the Bible says when the angel was there, he had to slap him side the head because he was sleeping in the middle. James had already been put to death. And they were expecting, Peter was expecting himself to be put to death. And the angel shows up and has to hit him to wake him up. All he could hear was a snore of faith. Where did he learn that from? He learned it by seeing Jesus in the midst of his storm. Instead of falling apart, he just slept in peace. And I'm telling you, you can get to the same position and same place. Because the Bible says God gives his beloved sweet sleep. So he said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? So look what Jesus said. Number one, he addressed fear. Why, why, why are you so fearful? And then he addressed, you're fearful because you have no faith. You have to develop your faith. They have to develop their faith. Jesus 
Jesus is, is with us. He's in us. But yet at the same time, he expects us to take responsibility for our actions and our behavior. He expects us to take responsibility for the authority that he's placed within our hands and that he has given us. And a lot of times what we do is beg, whine, and want Jesus to do something uh, for us. And we don't see that prayer get answered because Jesus is trying to get us to stand up and do what he's commanded and given us authority to do. And it doesn't mean that Jesus won't help us just like he did with Peter when he started to sing. But he wants us to mature. Because how in the world are you going to help somebody if you're not mature in the things of God? If you don't know the word, how are you going to help your neighbor when they are attacked? How are you going to help your co-worker? How are you going to help your relatives if they won't help if you don't know the word of God? Because you'll be brought right into their fear along with them and start speaking the same identical thing. If you're, not, if you're not careful, if you don't develop your faith, people who have no faith, people who live by fear, live by their emotions, live by what they see, feel, heal, and taste, instead of living by faith, they will influence you in such a way that they will now take you out of faith and bring you down into a position and place where you start acting the same identical way. And that is not the way God wants us to act. So when we look around our society today, you could say that the words fearful, anxious, panic-stricken, full of dread, stressful, full of worry, confused, full of doubt, and unbelieving is all over our society today and, and much around the world. It seems like that fear, the spirit of fear, is in control. Do you know how terrorists win? By using fear. Fear tactics. And we know who's behind that. So when we move, when we live and breathe fear, it causes what? Think about this. It causes your future to be unknown. It also, fear is like a a giant eraser. It will erase every past victory that you've had. Look. Children of Israel came out of Egypt. God decimated that nation. God took them down. The Israelites sit there and saw every miracle that God did. Yet when they came out, and they came out in revival, and they came, they came out and got over into the wilderness, going up to the Red Sea, and, and Pharaoh, who God just defeated, came after them, they all went into fear. They had forgotten everything that they had done. It's easy many times for us to get into fear and forget our past victories. Forget what God has done. When fear comes, it makes us feel out of control. And always remember this. Fear will always project the worst possible outcome that hasn't even happened. And then it will take God completely out of the equation. Fear also, this is how deadly fear is. Fear will get us to cause us to question God's love. That's what the disciples did. It will get us to question God's love, God's care, His ability and His willingness to help us as we face bigger than life problems and issues from day to day. So when we talk about the origin of fear, what is the origin of fear? First you have to say, what is the origin of man? God created man in his own image. You did not come from a monkey or some slime in a pond or a great explosion. God, you were created in the image of God. God did not create man and stand there and go, you didn't come from the planet of apes. When's the last time you've seen a monkey or an ape called in an interior decorator? When's the last time you've ever seen a bird say, you know, I'm tired of living this this nest, I want an A-frame. You don't see that in animals. Because the difference with animals, animals, 
They have a mind. They have, they have a soul, but they do not have a spirit. Only human beings have spirit. We were created in the image of Almighty God. And when we were created in the image of God, we were created to fear God. It's not a tormenting fear. It's not a fear of punishment. But it is a godly honor and respect and reverence of Almighty God. The Bible says in Psalms 111 verse 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It means that when I respect God and I will honor God, and I put God first place in everything that I do. And before I ever make a decision, I think, what does the Word of God say? What does God want me to do? That is called the fear of the Lord. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom. A good understanding have all of those who do His commandments. And His praise endures forever. So when it talks about the fear of the Lord, it means to, to, to the fear of the Lord means to respond to his revelation of, of himself with reverence, honor, and respect. And to stand under him in obedience to his love, his word, and commands. So man and woman, Adam and Eve, were created capable of receiving and becoming the dwelling place of divine love. And then revealing that love to one another and eventually revealing that love to the whole human race and all of creation. In other words, Adam and Eve had one purpose... To stand in obedience under the God who created them. Revealing God's love wherever and in whatever situation they found themselves. They literally, they lived in acute awareness of God's love. God's protection. God's provision. And they were dependent upon Him for strength, wisdom, and the ability to fulfill their destiny. They were created to rule and to reign in this world in obedience to God's word. And in and their obedience, now listen to this, this is so important. Their obedience would be the eternal declaration of their love to God. Their obedience would be their eternal declaration, and it's ours too, of the love for Almighty God. They would rule and reign. In Genesis, the... the Genesis, the first chapter, verses 26 and, and through 28. The, God said, let us make man in our own image. Let us create them, male and female. And then he said this, let us give them dominion. Give them dominion. And God said, have dominion. Subdue the earth. Have dominion and subdue the Now, this is so vitally important. So vitally, vitally important. So, so many people are crying out and asking Jesus to do things that he's empowered you and given you authority to do. So he said, let them have dominion. Notice, this is incredible. You've got to really see this. When God said, let us make man in our own image, that's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our own image. And then he turns around and he says, now, now that we've made them in our own image, then he says this. He didn't say, let us have dominion. Key word. He said, let them have dominion. They were given authority and God expect them to use that authority. And here's what he said. Let them have dominion and subdue the earth. Subdue it. What does that mean? The same thing that Jesus just did and when we saw in the, in the storm. The word subdue means this. If anything gets out of my will or out of control in the, way, in the opposite way that I created it, Adam and Eve, you put it back in. You subdue it. The word subdue also means to conquer. He said, I give you that authority. That's the reason which I've always, all the time, every time I read the Word of God, every time I go through the Bible, every time I get into Genesis, I sit there and say, Lord, if you'd have just intervened, we wouldn't be in this position. And the Lord always speaks back to me. If Adam would have just done what he had authority and dominion to do, you wouldn't be in this situation. A 
A lot of us find ourselves in a lot of situations because we won't take our God-given authority. What would happen if policemen did not take, law enforcement didn't take and use their authority? Where would we be today? We would be living in a total lawless society. And every one of us, everybody would be living in fear. Correct? And we, what would we do? We would get upset and we would wonder, why aren't they doing something? And it's the same thing when, when God looks at us. He's with us. He's in us. But he wants us. It's just like Jesus said, why are you so fearful? Why is it you have no faith? In other words, Jesus was expecting them to do something. That's what he was teaching them to do. He said, you've got to do something. The devil, what is so sad is the devil has so much free reign in Christians' lives and in their homes and in their, in, in, in their lives because we will not stand up and take our authority. We won't speak to the mountain. The Bible says, watch this, the Bible says whatever you bind on earth, whatever you bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. It didn't say whatever you G- asked Jesus to bind on earth. He said whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. We have a responsibility. And so many times we're laying that responsibility back on God and God is saying, no, I'm giving you that responsibility. I'm giving you the power. I'm your power. I'm your strength. I'll make sure and I'll back up everything that you, that you do, just like the police force, is, is, they back up the authority in what they do. City Hall backs it up, the same thing that God backs it up in everything that we do. But there's times that you and I have to stand up and take authority. When you get attacked mentally, you've got to do what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 3 and 5. Cast down every vain imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bring every thought into captivity. You can't sit there and say, Jesus, take this thought away. He said, no. You rebuke it. You take authority over it. You cast it out. Jesus, please do something about this depression. You do something about it. You take your authority. You use my word. You stand on my word. You address that situation. You address that attack. You address those negative thoughts. Don't sit there and listen to them and 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 just take it in and take it in and take it in because the don't don't you know that every thought is a seed? And the seeds will either bring up God's blessings, God's promises, God's things in your life, or they'll bring up weeds. One or the other. And so, so they were to rule and to reign. Their obedience under God would be the declaration of love of God. Listen to second, 1 John, the second chapter, verses 3 and 5. It says this. Now by this we know that we know him, that if we keep his commandments. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. In other words, that's a person who says, I know Jesus or I know God and just continues to live in sin. In other words, what God's saying is, no, that person really don't know me. It doesn't mean that we don't sin and we, we make mistakes at times. You know, every one of us make mistakes at times. This is a person who continually lives the same life and continues to live in sin. That person really doesn't know God. They may go to church. They may they say they know God, but they really don't know God. In other words, I seriously doubt that that person is born again. A person may be born again, but if a person is really, if a person is really born again, the Bible says the person cannot continue to live in sin because the seed of God is on the inside of him. Now, if a person loves God, is born again, and lives a life that is contrary to the Word of God, it can very well be that that person 
has not developed at all their renewed their mind or living or being led by the spirit because there is a place in the bible the bible talks about carnal christians they live by the flesh they operate by the flesh and with that the bible tells us that people who say well i love god here's the proof that we love god are we obeying him are we doing what he's, what he's telling us to do? Do, do? do we read the Word? Because the worst place that you can be in is when you have no knowledge of God's Word. Hosea 4.6 says this, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Notice this, he didn't say my people are destroyed because of the devil. He said my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Knowledge what? Not. Uh, the, the disciples, because of their lack of knowledge, their lack of faith, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, so their lack of faith, they did not operate. They thought that they were going to die. They didn't think that God cared about them or Jesus cared about them at all. But yet at the same time, the Bible tells us that if we have knowledge, you will drive out fear. Now watch this, because you only fear what you don't know. If you know going into a situation that Jesus says, I've already given you the victory. Even though you may have the symptoms of fear, what's going to come out of your mouth is what's in your heart. And if death comes out of your mouth, be sure you can probably die. If what comes out of your mouth is contrary to the Word of God and you start speaking everything contrary or, or what is opposite of God's Word, you're emboldening and empowering the kingdom of darkness to bring to pass into your life the very things that you're speaking out of your life. That's the reason the Bible tells us that death and life is in the power of the tongue. And then in, the, in James, the third chapter, it says your tongue is a rudder. It's the rudder for your whole life. The direction that you're going in, what you're doing in your life, comes from what you're speaking out of your mouth. And what you speak out of your mouth is coming out of your heart. So if you don't like what's coming out of your mouth, change what's in your heart. Fill your heart with the Word of God, and when something happens, immediately what will come out is God's Word. So he says this. He said, but whoever keeps his Word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. That's so vitally important. But whoever keeps, the word keeps there means this. It's like a sentinel. It's like, it's like someone in the military that is on duty and is guarding the gate. And he says, whoever guards my word. Remember the Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it flows the issues of life. Every issue in my life is determined how I address it, how I speak to it, how I pray about it, and what I say after and through and in the issue. That will determine how the issue is going to come out. How I address it. Because if my mouth and my tongue is a rudder, whatever I'm saying is directing me through that issue, through that circumstance. Even when David, it looked like that his life was going to be over, he made this statement. He said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. You're with me. I know you're with me. So therefore, even though I'm walking through this valley, even though Death is all around me and the shadow of death is there. I am not going to fear that because you're with me. That's the key. It's with me. The biggest mistake that Dave, one of the biggest mistakes, we know that he made some, made, made some just like we make mistakes. 
But one of the biggest mistakes that David made is when he was getting weary of Saul chasing him. See, a lot of times we get weary in the problems that we face. We, we do get weary. And that's the reason that I, I, I'm constantly telling everybody that you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So that you can get your spiritual prayer language that God gives you that is supernatural. Because the Bible says, he who prays in an unknown tongue builds himself up. They're spiritual, it's spiritual batteries. Spiritual recharger. And as I pray in the spirit, it keeps me built up. It keeps me strong. It keeps me going. It keeps me moving. No wonder Paul, the apostle Paul, look at everything that he went through. All the beatings, shipwrecks, robbers, all the crazy stuff that he went through. Whippings, stoning. You know what he said? He said, I pray in tongues more than you all. And he's speaking to the whole Corinthian church. He said, I pray in tongues more than all of you. Because that's what keeps me going. That's a little side note. That's what keeps you going. He says, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. The more that I keep God's word, stand on God's word, obey God's word, no matter what people think, no matter what people say, no matter what I see in the natural, no matter what my problem and circumstances are saying to me, I'm going to stand on God's word. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to guard my heart with all diligence because out of it comes the issues of life. Out of my mouth will come the issues of death or the issues of life. So I want to make sure that God, God's word, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He said, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So the more that I know God's word, understand God's word, operates in God's word, obeys God's word, then Guess what? Love is perfected on the inside of me. My love for God. To a point that no matter what happens to me, I will not disclaim him. No matter what I go through, I will not throw in the towel. I will not quit. I'll keep pressing on. I'll keep moving right on. Knowing that no matter what happens, no matter what comes my way, I know what Romans 8.28 says. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. I don't know how this is going to work out. I just know what God's word says. I have his promise. But I know you're going to cause it to work for my good. You're going to turn this around and you're going to cause it to work for my good. And I'm not coming off of it. I'm not backing off. I'm not shutting down. I'm going to continue to, to, to go on. He said, by this we know that we are in him. So, why is it so important? Why was it important for Adam and Eve to be obedient to God and take their authority and use it? Because God would have backed it up. Have you ever thought about this? When the enemy shows up in your life, sometimes you think God is silent. When the enemy, when the devil, and the devil will always show up. The enemy will always show up. Problems and circumstances are always going to come. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. He said, you're going to have these things. He said, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome. I've overcome it for you. So the enemy, the enemy is going to show up. He's going to show up at times. When he showed up in the garden, why didn't God say something? Why didn't God do something? Because God had already said something. He had already given Adam his commandments. He had already told him exactly what he needed him to do. He had already told him that if anything comes that, that, that is not right, you have the authority to put it out, to deal with it. And it's the same thing in our lives. A lot of times when we think God is silent, he's not silent. He's just waiting right now. He's just waiting to manifest his power by us acting in accordance to who we are. To what he's given us. To the authority. He's waiting for you to bind something. He's waiting for you to lose something. He's waiting for you to speak. And to move. And to declare. And to prophesy. 
Why didn't God intervene when Goliath showed up? A little 17-year-old David came. And when 17-year-old David showed up, he had no idea what was going to happen that day. But he was prepared because he had the word of the covenant on the inside of him. He knew the covenant. He was prepared because he had already dealt with a bear and a lion. See, before you ever face Goliath, before you ever face the big problems, you're going to have to handle the little ones as they come along. And the little ones that come along are preparing you to handle the big ones because I can tell you right now, some bigger ones will come. Amen? And so when David got in front of Goliath, Goliath began to prophesy to him. He said, today, I'm going to serve you up. I'm going to kill you, and I'm, the birds are going to have a feast. And they're going to feast on you. And then he mocked him. Don't you know the devil will mock you at times? Don't you know that he will say all kinds of things about you to make you think that you're a nothing and you're a nobody? I mean, the devil looked at him and he said, who is this runt? Who is this little nothing of nobody coming out against me? I'm a professional warrior. Who do you think you are coming out here like this? And you have, what do you got in your hand? Nothing but a sling and a stone. The devil will look at you. What do you think you're doing? What do you have? What you got? You got a testimony? You got some word? What's that going to do against me? People will say things to you trying to intimidate you. Trying to make you think that you're a nothing and a nobody. And you can't do anything right. You're not going to accomplish and achieve anything. Who do you think you are? All the stuff that you think that you're going to do or you are. Oh, I know you're getting your hopes up. But that's not for the likes of you. That's for somebody else. No, you are a failure. No, you're an accident. You, you, you shouldn't even be here. You're a nothing. You're a nobody. You're not going to amount to anything. Who, who do you think you are? The devil will intimidate you, folks. And what did David do? David just didn't stand there and say, you know, you're right. I'm just a little shepherd boy. What do I think I'm doing out here? All the army over there is hiding in the foxholes. They've been trained for this. I don't know why I'm out here. I don't know why. God, help me right now. He didn't do that. He didn't text his friends. I really need some prayer right now. He didn't have anybody to text because they were all hiding in the foxholes. He was out there all by himself and nobody was backing him up. Sometimes you'll find yourself in the middle of your storm. You'll find yourself in your circumstances and, 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 and you have a tendency to get mad and upset but because why aren't people calling me? Why aren't people doing something about this? Where's the pastor? Where's the church? Why aren't they? Aren't do, I, they need to be doing something about this. And God said, no. You need to grow up. You need to mature. You need to do something about this. <laughs> David did not have a victim's mentality when he went on when he went out on that battlefield, he did not have a victim's mentality. He knew his God. He's just a teenager. He was a millennial. All the baby boomers were hiding in the foxholes. Who knows where Generation X was? But he was a millennial, and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who is taunting the armies of God? Man, when the devil hears you stand up and said, who do you think you are bringing that type of talk and that type of language into my head? No, David prophesied back to him. The, 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 the Goliath prophesied to him what he was going to do. And David said, let me tell you what. 
God's going to do. He said, today, I'm taking your head. Oh, yeah, today, you're going to be fed to the birds. Today is your last day. It is over with. You're out of here. You are no more. And what David did, David got up and he ran toward Goliath. And then God, in his action and his deeds, God calls the problem, God calls the situation, God calls that man to fall. Because listen, ladies and gentlemen, whatever you're facing, whatever you're facing, God's on your side. God's on your side. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, God favors you. God's on your side. God will back you up. God is there to manifest the actions of faith in your life. If you will take those actions and you'll stand in faith and you'll get out of the pit of despair and depression and depression and get up and say, in the name of Jesus, this is what the Word says. In the name of Jesus, this is what God says. In the name of Jesus, I'm going forward. And address your situation. And here's what you do with fear. 1 John 4, and we'll end with this. 1 John 4, 18 and 19. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect or matured in love. We love him because he first loved us in other words when I have the revelation knowledge of how much God loves me and how much he cares for me and what he did for me and knowing that he loves me beyond my comprehension in in that love what did Jesus live in listen to this very carefully Jesus lived in one statement that was made to him on the day On the day that he went in, he was getting ready to start his ministry. He was being baptized. He came out of the water, and God identified him, gave him identity. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In other words, he said, this is the son that I love. And do you know, in Ephesians, the first chapter, God says the same thing about you. He calls you the beloved. He says, you are my beloved. When you understand the depth, the breadth, and the height. No wonder Paul said, I pray that they will come to know the depth, the height, the, the width, the, the breadth of your love. Because when you, under know, when you understand that God loves you, he's not against you. He loves you and cares for you. You can face anything. And what do you do? What do you do when you understand the love of God? When you understand you have the Word of God? When you understand that, that, that God will bring you through every situation? Yes, we face disappointments. We go through things that, 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 that happen to us. We understand that. But God has never left us. He has never, le- He's never left us. He has never forsaken us. And His Word is still His Word. And we stand on that. And continue to stand on it. And no matter what I go through, no matter what I face, no matter what happens to me, I will continue to stand. I will continue to go forward. I will continue to build my faith. I will continue to to love God. I will continue to say, God, you reign. God, you do this. God, you're going to do that. And God says, I'll back you up. There's so many things in my own life that I have to speak to that I have to address in the name of Jesus there's so many things in my life that I have to take authority over and believe God for And some of those things that I pray about some of those things that I stand on the word of God I, I find myself at times standing and standing and standing and standing and standing and then when I don't know what else to do I continue to stand And stand and stand and stand. And I've been doing that for 47 years of walking with God. And I've had plenty of disappointments and tragedy and things like that. But I'm still standing. I'm still standing here right now. 
I'm still standing. The devil's tried to take me out many times, but I'm still standing. And I'm standing on God's Word. And I'm going to tell you, your authority is real. Your dominion is real. The Word of God is real. Just make a decision. You're going to live it. You can't be running out there committing adultery and fornication, lying, cheating, and stealing, and all that stuff, and expect that every time you do something, it's going to work for you. It doesn't work like that. You have to make a decision, put your flesh under, and you have to obey God. You have to obey God. Get into obedience, and if you do something, be quick to repent. Don't let the flesh take you and put you in the crazy situations. Believe God. Stand on the Word. Obey God. You might be the only one obeying God. Nobody else may be obeying God. But you obey God. You don't, you're not trying to impress anybody. Quit trying to get the gifts of the Spirit and things like that to try to get a reputation or try to impress somebody. You're supposed to use that not to build your ministry, but to help people. live in humility kindness and clothe ourselves with that as you do that when you need the power of God it will flow like plugging into an electric socket just stay in alignment with God no matter what anybody else is doing no matter what they're saying stay in alignment with God If you stay in alignment with God and walk in obedience to Him, instead of trying to be accepted by your friends, the the, let, let me tell you this, the worst fear in the world is the fear of man. Trying to be accepted, trying to make a name for yourself, trying to be affirmed, trying to get love out of all the wrong places. That's nothing but a trap. It brings destruction to you. Love God Love His Word. Love people. Walk in obedience to God. And then when the storms show up, take your authority in the name of Jesus. Take your authority in Jesus' name. Let me give you this last scripture. Did I just say that a while ago? I got one scripture. Let me just read this to you. Psalms 56. This is when David, the Philistines were after him. He said this, Be merciful to me, O God, for man will swallow me up. You ever felt like that your circumstances will swallow you up? Fighting all day, he oppresses me. The enemy, a lot of times, won't give up. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Whenever I am afraid, because every one of us have the symptoms of fear, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Now watch this. In God, I will praise His Word. In God, I will praise His Word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Did you notice He said, I will praise your Word. I'm going to praise your Word. That's what I do all my, that's what, that's what I've done all my life. I find the scripture, I got the promise, and I just start. Father, I just praise your, I just praise you and praise your word. Because he and his word are one. The word was God, and the word, it is God. It's his word, they're one together. You know, people say, oh, yeah, that, 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 those word people. So all they talk about, the Word, the Word, the Word. I said, God and His Word are one. Is one. Because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Can you say amen? Would you bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment? I want to give you an opportunity. If you've never received Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, I want to give you an opportunity right now for God to forgive you of your sins. Jesus came not only just to to forgive your sins he did that and he became sin for us so that we could be in the family of God that's what he came to be reconnected with God reconnected with him there is not different avenues different ladders for you 
to get into the kingdom of God, the, the family of God, or to get into heaven. There's only one way. It's through Jesus Christ. You can, God said, no one, Jesus said, no one can come to the Father but through me. He is the door. He is the way. Anybody that tells you any different is an absolute lie. It's, it's a deception. It's the only way. You have to ask yourself, when I leave this earth, and you don't know when that's going to be, but when I leave this earth, when I leave this earth, where will I go? Where will I spend eternity? Because you just are not obliterated. You're not, you're not just non-existence anymore. Because the spirit man that lives on the inside of you is either going to go one or two places. God wants you to be in heaven. He does not want you to be in hell. Hell was created for the devil and all those who rebelled against him. But if I come into that rebellion and reject God's free gift, that's where my eternal life is going to be forever and it never stops. And I must warn you for that and let you know that that's a reality. But God doesn't want you there. That's the reason he loves you and he cares for you and he sent Jesus And the moment that you believe that and you receive Jesus as your Lord is the moment that you begin a brand new life and your sins are forgiven and God brings you into the family. But maybe you knew the Lord at one time, you've gotten away from Him and you just say, "Uh, Pastor, I've done so many things. Well, you know what? The Bible says that God is faithful, that if you repent of your sin, He's faithful and just to forgive you. You can be forgiven right now and get right back into fellowship and head toward exactly where God has for you your purpose, and your destiny. I'm going to pray right now. I'm going to pray. And if you want to receive Jesus as the Lord of your life, or you say, I've been away from the Lord, and I want to come back to the family. I want to come back into fellowship with God. I want to restore that position in place. If that's you, and you want to be in this prayer that I'm getting ready to pray, all I want you to do right where you are, just slip up your hand so that I can see wherever you are all over this auditorium. Thank you. God bless you. Yes, God bless you. Thank you. Yes, God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Yes. Yes, God bless you. Anyone else? Say, Pastor, that's me. Anyone else? Say, Pastor, that's me. Anyone else? Say, Pastor, that's me. All right, all of you that raised your hands, I want you to pray this with me, and we're all going to pray this together with you. Let's pray this out loud. Father God, I thank you right now for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for Jesus. I believe Jesus is your son. He came to this earth. He died. You raised him from the dead. Jesus is alive. I repent of all my sin and ask your forgiveness in Jesus' name. And this day, I confess Jesus Christ as Lord of my life. Thank you, Father, for forgiving me, and thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray, and everybody said, amen and amen and amen. Come on, let's give God praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We welcome you into the family of God. Amen.